Good evening and welcome to Crossroads Career Webinar tonight. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, we're always happy to have you. Uh, my name is Tom Jacobson. On a volunteer basis, I lead a Woodbury, or I lead a Crossroads group out of Woodbury, Minnesota at Woodbury Lutheran Church. Um, we have three Twin Cities locations, one in Woodbury, one in Arden Hills, and one in Eden Prairie. Um, but right now, uh, we have been for the last three years doing a uh, several seminars a month, uh, all online through Zoom. So uh, welcome through our our uh, the great medium of Zoom, and uh, hopefully you'll you'll uh, have a great time and learn a lot and uh, take away some great messages tonight. Um, Crossroads uh, is a um, transition group. Uh, we provide help for and assistance for those who are in transition. We're also a, a religious group, one with uh, a ministry that uh, takes care of the folks uh, in transition. So, um, and everything that we, most everything that we do is free of charge for those who use it. Um, so Crossroads, uh, you know, can deliver for a lot of people in who may be unemployed or looking for a different job, who may be stressed from a, a job, um, but in transition and looking uh, and needing help. And that's what we provide uh, at Crossroads. Tonight, uh, I'll share with you quickly our agenda. Um, right now, I'm doing a brief introduction for you of Crossroads and what we're doing tonight. Uh, and uh, after about five minutes of uh, this, I will uh, so we will play a video of, uh, and tonight's theme is courage. Um, and uh, you'll find that the, uh, the video that we play uh, shows great courage and uh, overcoming a lot. And, uh, and uh, that will be from, and I'll introduce that right after this. And then uh, our main speaker will be Dave Cornell, who will deliver uh, his message on cultivating courage. And then uh, that he, he will, his uh, seminar will be about um, an hour long. And then at the end of that, I will uh, go over what we deliver with Crossroads, um, our programs and the different things, the features of Crossroads uh, at the end. And then, then you're free to go. So that'll be tonight's agenda. Um, now I'd like to share some wisdom uh, from the Bible. And uh, I picked a, a, a verse tonight from Psalms 31, 24, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. So it's a message that says, you know, if you trust in the Lord and believe in him, he will deliver what you need, the courage you need, everything you need in order to be successful. And hopefully, through that message, you know, we, we can be buoyed with the hope that we need in transition um, to do the things that are necessary, to seek out the, the opportunities that we want so that we can be successful in our lives and be happy with our, our opportunities so that we can provide and do the things we want uh, in our careers so that, you know, we lead productive and happy lives. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, then at this point, do a quick prayer. Lord, thank you for bringing us all together tonight. Thank you for sharing the, our gift, uh, giving us the opportunity to share our gifts and to share the messages that we have tonight in the, in the ways that we do. Um, help us if we're in transition to look to you for strength, to talk with you and to share our trials and our tribulations so that we can get, gather ourselves and move forward. Hopefully you share, share the um the path that you want us to take and that we'll be able to to uh, find the opportunities that best serve us and you and give us the opportunities to, to have a great career um, and help us uh, through the next week so that uh, you know as we uh, transition from the beautiful weather we've been having to then the re regular average weather that we we can be happy with that and be uh, and just enjoy what spring has to offer here uh, in the upper Midwest. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so at this time, 
I'd like to um, introduce uh, tonight's video. Uh, it's uh, uh, from a woman named uh, Jessica Long, and uh, she's a, a, a para Olympian who is a champion. Uh, and her story has many struggles. Uh, and uh, if we all had the courage uh, that this woman displays uh, and the perseverance and the, the wherewithal to be successful, uh, we would have nothing to worry about at all. Uh, especially me, who um, I can't go through a day without one negative thought. Uh, this, uh, uh, this person shows above average uh, uh, strength and courage. So uh, enjoy the video. Uh, it's an uh, I'm second uh, from Jessica Long and her Olympic championship. It's pretty intense because you're sitting there and they're calling each person and they just somehow disappear through this walkway. And then they call your name and you walk out and it's this beautiful like clean pool. There's just 25,000 people and you can hear the roar. My heart rate is starting to pick up. All of Team USA is cheering for me. I take off my legs, I take off my warm up jacket and I get up to, to the block. I clap three times. I hope it somewhat intimidates the rest of the competitors a little bit. The official says, take your mark. Take your mark. Go. The crowd goes wild once I'm midair. And I hold my streamline, I pick my head up, and I just start to race. A lot of people are changing positions. I feel like I need to breathe because I'm gasping for air, but I know if I take that breath, it's going to affect my race. I always know that at the start, I'm going to be behind. Seconds matter. Tenths of a second matter. I know that I can catch up coming in for the wall. This is when the entire race comes down to the ending. But I just put my head down, and then all I hear is just this, like, quiet peace. When I was born, I was put up for adoption by a young 16-year-old Russian girl. And due to a birth defect, um, she just wasn't able to care for me. During this time uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, there was a family, Steve and Beth Long. They went to a church meeting and they saw a picture of me and they were told that this little Russian girl has leg deformities and um, really needed to be adopted. And my mom just said, you know, we, we knew we, you were the child that God wanted us to adopt. So they decided to adopt me and another little boy from Russia. Went to the orphanage and, and got us both. Right away, they took me to see a specialist about my legs. And with what I was born with, um, it's called fibular hemimelia. So basically means I was missing all the bones in my lower legs. I did have a foot with three toes um, that they decided to amputate six months after I was adopted. So I could be fitted in these little prosthetic legs and learn to walk just like everyone else. When I think back on my childhood, I didn't feel adopted. I just knew I was angry angry that I didn't have legs. Maybe that's why my birth mom didn't want me, because I didn't look like a normal person. I was missing half of my body. I felt like such a burden to my parents in Baltimore, you know, because every time I grew, I had to get a surgery. I had to get the bone cut back. And that was excruciating. I can't think of a single childhood memory that, you know, we weren't always at church or with our church community. And what I heard a lot of is that God, God made me this way and God always had a plan for me, and God loves me, and I didn't like it. I knew I didn't like it. I knew I didn't want anything to do with this God that made me this way. To top it all off, I was born on leap year. So all of my life, the calendar would skip me every four years um, before I had an actual birthday, February 29th. And I think in my head as a little girl that just solidified how I felt about myself, is that I was non-existent. It didn't seem fair, because I didn't, I don't think I knew what I did wrong to have to keep going back in for surgery. I didn't think I could even cry in front of my parents, because I thought if I cried that somehow they would send me back to Russia. No one could help me, and it just hurt all the time. So eventually, I, I found sport, and I found that I was really good at sports. I found that swimming, I excelled in swimming. And when I first joined a swim team, I was 10 years old and I was the only disabled swimmer on the team. Most people didn't know I was missing my legs until I got out of the pool. 
And I kept going back because honestly, I just liked beating these girls with legs. And it started to fulfill something in me, just earning love. Is it too good to be true? I want this so much, but don't know if I can trust you. In my first race, I turn and breathe to my competitor from Israel, and I remember saying, I did not come here to get second. And we touched the wall, and I had just won my first Paralympic gold medal as a little 12-year-old. And I was the youngest to ever go, the youngest to ever win a gold medal. And I think that that was the start of it. I started getting sponsorships and winning awards. I signed a deal with Nike, and I'm in Sports Illustrated, and I'm getting commercials. And I wanted to be perfect in everything that I did. There was one year I had 18 world record breaking performances, and I didn't slow down. Reached the next gold medal, set the next world record. That's where my worth was. My worth was in swimming. My identity was swimming. But at the same time, I was just broken and sad a lot. I had developed an eating disorder, really pulled away from my relationships, my family, and I realized that I had no control over my life. One summer night, I was at my Friday night youth group Bible study, and I'm sitting there, and I just think, I just couldn't do it alone anymore. I just got up, and I, I made the walk to the front, and I found this woman, and I just said, you know, I, I want to give God my whole heart for once. And I prayed with her, and as soon as I prayed, it was the first time in my entire life that I felt enough, and that I was actually a part of God's family for once. And it's crazy, right? Because it, it doesn't just get easier. Um, I just realized that God was prepping my heart for what was about to come. I'm in London at the games. I found out that they had found my birth family over in Russia. All of a sudden, we were approached by NBC, asking if I wanted to go back to Russia to meet my birth mom for the first time. Meeting my family, my birth mom, was something I dreamed of my entire life. So I decided to do that, and I took my little sister Hannah with me. It hit me all of a sudden, as soon as we landed in Russia, that maybe my birth family didn't want to see me. I felt relief, scared. Why, why did I come here? Why did I do this? And then we took an 18-hour train ride, 18 hours, and everything is covered in snow. I just kept reapplying lipstick and makeup. And Hannah um, said she didn't even put the lid on the lipstick because she was like, you just were so nervous. You just kept applying. And I think it was just because I wanted to present myself so perfectly yet again. So we pull up in front of their little purple house, and I took my sister's hand, and we walked together on this, the snowy, icy sidewalk. And you could hear my birth mom, Natalia, and my, my birth father were crying. Like they were, you could just hear, you could hear tears. They come out of the back door, and my birth mom, I mean, she's just burst, I mean, just crying, sobbing. She just kept saying, my, my Lena, I think she was saying my daughter. But she's crying, my birth father's crying. I was starting to cry, and I was like, I don't want to cry. And something she just kept saying was that she couldn't forgive herself for giving me up for adoption. And I think if I had not accepted Christ as my savior, I don't think I would have forgiven her either. But it was in that moment that I realized that, you know, God has forgiven me my, my whole life. And I did, I forgave my mom. You know, I wasn't upset with her. And it was this moment that I'd been, I'd been angry my entire life. You know, I didn't feel worthy, I didn't feel enough, that I just realized, oh my gosh, like God really had had a plan this entire time. Coming home after Russia, it definitely, um, it was a heart change, but it also opened up a lot of other questions and questions that I had to really come to terms and talk to God about, you know, um, questions and that I thought I already had answered. And I realized that it's okay to have those questions. It, it, it's okay to talk to God about it. You know, since accepting Christ as my savior, I don't have to just go to God and, and have it all together. He knows that I don't have it all together. And I think it's something I still fight. You know, I still fight that feeling of being in control. And I am constantly reminded every day that I need to give it to God. Every day when I put on these two prosthetic legs, 
that are heavy and they still hurt me. My legs still cause me pain. And I think it's honestly this really cool, beautiful reminder that I can't do it on my own. As determined as I am, I just can't. Coming in for the wall. This is when the entire race comes down to the ending. But I just put my head down and just pictured God almost racing alongside with me when I swim, like he's just there. And when practices get tough or races have been hard, I just call on to him, like, God, like, this is hard. This is really hard. And I just feel, you know, just keep trying, Jess. Like, I'm here with you. My name is Jessica Long, and I am second. Okay, wow, that was a, again, I, uh, every time I see that, uh, that video, I, I, I think how, how difficult it must be and then think about how easy my life is um, from that perspective. But uh, um, next is Dave uh, Cornell, who's going to speak to us on cultivating courage tonight. Dave has been doing this for a very long time, has helped hundreds of thousands of people uh, in doing that actually cultivating courage and putting courage in there, having courage in their life. And he's going to share his message tonight with us. And uh, hopefully we'll be uh, inspired from that. Uh, Dave, I'm just going to let you go from there and introduce your topic. And if you want uh, any type of questions or anything, we use the chat uh, uh, and uh, you can read it or one of us can do it. Just let us know how you want to do it and we'll go from there. All Thanks. right, that sounds good, Tom. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask you and Harry to kind of keep an eye on the chat as uh, it's difficult for me as I'm going through my slides and things to to sometimes be checking on it. And so I'm going to ask that if uh, one of you two guys could uh, just take a look at that, that would be great. And what a powerful video that is. And uh, I, I wrote down a note to myself uh, that sometimes courage chooses us in, in Jessica's case she didn't really have any choice. Uh, it was choose courage or misery. And, uh, and she had to, she, she obviously chose courage. Um, and sometimes we have an opportunity to choose courage ourselves, And that's what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, choosing to be courageous when we may not want to be. And so I'm going to start out by sharing my screen. And um, so give me just a moment here to get this up. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be with you tonight. And I jotted down the names of everybody that's here. So uh, great to see all of you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I've had the opportunity to um, be a part of the Crossroads ministry several times and uh, always enjoy the opportunity to be with you. So I want you, as we start out tonight, I want you to think about a time when you did something courageous. Think as far back as you can as to what was one of the first courageous things that you might have done. For me, the very first courageous memory that I have, this is what I was looking through. I had just finished kindergarten, and in the fall, I would be in the first grade, and I was at my older brother Phil's baseball game. He had finished second grade, and he would be in the third grade in the fall. And my brother's team is taking the baseball field for the last half of the last inning. And if they got the team out, they would win the game. Very quickly, they got two outs. And as I'm standing behind the backstop with my two best friends, Dennis and Doug, the guy coming up representing the third out in the game and the victory for my brother's team was a, was a guy named Billy. Now, Billy, in the little town of Wahoo, Nebraska, where I was living at that point in time, Billy was a tough guy. He was a bully, and he was a guy that you did not mess with. And as Billy was coming up to the plate, Dennis and Doug said, Dave, we dare you to yell at Billy while he's at bat. I said, no way. I am not doing that. Come on, Dave. We dare you. We dare you. We dare you. And then they did what we actually did back in the day. They said, Dave, we double dog dare you. Well, you know, you cannot turn, the down, turn down the double dog dare. So as Billy began to wind up and go into his uh, get ready for the pitch, he 
he said, uh, the pitch started to come in and I hollered, swing, batter, swing. Billy swung and he missed. Dennis and Doug and I jumped up and down and we uh, punched each other in the arms because the high five hadn't even been invented yet. And we turned to look again and Billy is staring right at me. Dennis and Doug got all excited by that and they yelled some more. Come on, Dave, one more time, one more time. Pitcher goes into his windup. He fires that pitch. Swing, batter, swing. Billy swings and misses strike two. We jump up and down some more, punch each other in the arms some more. We turn and look. Billy is staring right at me again. Pitcher goes into his windup for that third pitch. Dennis and Doug are saying, come on, Dave, one more time, one more time. The pitch comes in. I holler, swing, batter, swing. Billy swings and misses strike three. My brother's team wins the game. Dennis and Doug and I jump up and down. We turn to walk away, and boom, standing directly in front of me just a few seconds later is Billy. Billy had dropped his bat, quickly come around the backstop, and I am now looking up at him, my eyes at his chin. I suddenly see him begin to clench his fist, and he rears back, and pow, he hits me right in the stomach. Well, he actually hit me a little bit lower. He hit me right in the bladder, and he literally made me wet my pants. Now, I can still remember to this day the warm feeling that I had. No, not because I'd wet my pants, but because I'd had the courage to do something that Dennis and Doug did not have the courage to do. There is a price to doing things that require courage. But I believe there is an even greater price to living in fear. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight in our transitions of maybe we're changing jobs, maybe we're out of work, but it requires us to have some courage to make the changes in our career transitions. Fear, okay, I'm having a problem here. Quickly, let me change something. All right, I've got to go out and come back in. Give me just a moment here. Not sure what. I wasn't able to advance my slides. My apologies here. There, we should be, there we go. Fear is something that we all face, and yet we rarely talk about it. We want to present ourselves to people that life is good, we've got everything under control, when maybe we really don't. And we heard in Jessica's story, she didn't feel she could even talk to her mom about stuff, about the challenging things that were going on in her life. So she kept them to herself. We don't call up our friends and say, hey, let's go get a cup of coffee or let's go have a beer. And while we're there, let's talk about our fears. No, we hold those things in, even oftentimes with the closest people in our lives. Courage, on the other hand, is a word that we often reserve for firefighters and police officers and soldiers. We don't see ourselves as courageous beings. Courage is something that other people do. And the reality is, I believe that we often have opportunities to be courageous every single day. The foundational verse for this uh, message tonight is Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, here's what I envision with this scripture passage. And if you know the story you know that Moses has been leading the people out of the promised land, and he now has died. And so he is not able to lead the people into the promised land. Joshua was second in command, and now Joshua is the one who is going to lead the people into the promised land. And so the, the 30 days of mourning is over, and here's what I envision in my mind as I think about this verse. I envision God and Joshua standing on a hill, looking down into the promised land. And God has his arm around Joshua, and he is saying, listen, you are headed into a land that you know nothing about. There is a lot of turmoil that you are going to be facing. I know what you're going to face. You don't. 
And I am commanding you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Well, as you go in this transition process, whatever that looks like for you, the very same God that had his arm around Joshua has his arm around you. And you don't know what steps are in front of you. And yet God is telling you, I will be with you wherever you go. I will push you to go to places that may make you uncomfortable. I am commanding you be strong and courageous. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Always remembering that the very same God of Joshua is the very same God that we serve. There's two kinds of fear that we save in our lives, face in our lives. There's rational fear. If the building that you're in or the basement of my home that I'm sitting in were to catch on fire, we can all agree it would be a rational thing to get up and get out, make sure that others are safe. If we can grab anything, we'll do that. But there's probably going to be a level of fear. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. That's rational fear. Some of you may have faced uh, life-altering or life-changing illnesses. Uh, there is a rational fear around those. But what we're going to talk about tonight is irrational fear. And this is the kind of fear where we lay in bed at night and we say to ourselves, why did I not call that guy that I got the number from my good friend and he told me, call this guy, he's got a job that you might be a perfect fit for, but I was afraid to call him. Or why did I not hold my kids accountable when I told them, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And they did this and I didn't do anything about it. And we can go on and on and on of the things that we lay in bed at night and we say, why didn't I? Or if I only had or whatever it might be. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. The irrational fears. And so what does that look like? Well, this is what it looks like. Not being good enough. Not being worthy. Fear of what others might think or say. The fear of what if. What if? How many times have we asked that to ourselves? What if? The need to meet others' expectations, not being smart enough, being too young or too old. And I let you read the, the rest of that list. So how does fear show up in our lives then? If these are the things that we're worried about, these are the things that we say in our mind, what does that look like? It looks like avoidance, procrastination, perfection, blame, settling, compromising, rationalizing, apologizing. You might be able to add to that list. I can tell you from my own personal experience, and you'll hear about it more here in a little bit, I'm, a, I, I'm an expert at those top three, avoidance, procrastination, and perfection. And we'll talk about those more. But how does fear show up in your life? I'm going to give you a moment to ponder this slide and this picture. My son-in-law took this picture on his way to the Boundary Waters canoe area many years ago. And the question that I ask myself as I look at this, obviously somebody made a decision to go around to avoid do any, doing anything with that branch and left a mark in the road. And the question that I ask myself is, how far out in the road would that branch have had to be before it would have made a difference for them to get out, before it would have made a big enough difference for them to get out and, and move it? Obviously, this wasn't far enough. And I think that's the way our fears are. Oftentimes, our fears start out as, as smaller things, but we avoid dealing with them. We sweep them under the rug. We pretend they're not there, and they get bigger, and they get bigger, and they get bigger. And then, all of a sudden, our fears look like this. They become a boulder that is now holding us hostage, keeping us from where we want to go. This is a picture that was taken in the mountains of Colorado. Where we want to be is where that red truck is on the other side of the boulder. In order for us to get to that spot in the mountains of Colorado, from where we're sitting or being parking, parked in our car looking at this boulder, it's a 233-mile detour. Wow. We've all taken detours in our lives. I've taken a lot of detours. Often detours can lead us to places that are pretty exciting. Through some of the detours that I had in my work life, I, I worked with a, great companies. I worked with amazing people, got, some, got great memories. 
but I would often come back to this boulder because there was something else that I wanted. And I'll tell you about that more in here in a minute. But I would push and I would push and I would push and that boulder would never move. So I'd take another detour. And so what are the detours that you've taken in your life? Maybe that you're taking now that you're either avoiding dealing with something, you're procrastinating, uh, very similar. You are waiting for things to be just right, just perfect before you move on. What are those things? Never underestimate the value of a crisis is the first point that I want to share tonight. Romans 5, 3, and 4 says, we, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. Jessica's story is truly a story of these two verses. She suffered. She persevered. That perseverance developed character, and that character developed hope. Back in January of 2010, my wife and I were living in the Twin Cities. I live in Fergus Falls now. We were living in the Twin Cities, and I lost my job. And in 2010, you may remember from 2008 to 2012, somewhere in there, the economy was horrible. I did not know that at the time because I'd been working. I wasn't paying attention to the fact that the economy was horrible. I thought I'm a pretty capable guy. I'll be able to find a job in, in a month or two. It shouldn't be that big a deal. Well, I found out very quickly that the economy was so bad, as I started to attend networking groups like Crossroads, Crossroads and others, I began to realize that there were lots and lots of people far more capable than I, than I was that were not finding jobs and had been out for a long, long time. Fast forward 13 months to February of 2011, my wife loses her job. She'd been working in a church for 15 years. Giving was down. Somebody had to be let go, and my wife was the first. Over the course of two years, we went through all of our savings. In June of 2011, we finally sold our house. We had enough for one more payment uh, before we went into foreclosure. And so in June of 2011, we had no jobs, we had no money, and we had no place to live. It was a crisis time in our life. Yet I can tell you today that it truly is one of the best things that has ever happened to us. My wife might disagree with you a little bit on that, but she's come around and, and recognized the value in it. But for me, that situation forced me to deal with some issues that had been going on in my life for most of my life that I had avoided. And I'll tell you about those in just a minute. But be able, be able to recognize the opportunity when we face challenge in our life to step back from the crisis and say, okay, Lord, what are you teaching me here? What am I supposed to learn? And how can I be better? How can I uh, go through this suffering and persevere and develop character and through that character, develop hope? I can guarantee you if you step back from the crisis and don't wallow in it, doesn't mean that you don't uh, live in it a little bit because you, you have to. You have to deal with the crisis. But recognize the need at some point to step back and begin to say, okay, Lord, what do you have for me here? I'm not saying you're glad that it happened. I'm not glad that happened to me. Uh, you, it's not anything I want to go through again. But recognize the value in a crisis. So tonight we're going to look at three steps to courage. Step number one is to name your fear. I say it's like being an alcoholic or a drug addict. If you're not willing to acknowledge the fear that you have, it's never going to change. Think about the, Moses in Exodus 3 and 4. God came to Moses and said, Moses, I want you to do this. And Moses, he had all kinds of excuses why he should not be the one. Remember, Moses killed a guy. And he knew what was going on in his mind and what his character was like. And yet this is a person that God chose to lead the people out of the promised land. Oftentimes our fear is a result of a bad experience. Maybe you've been in a transition before and it didn't go well. And you're thinking, here I am again. I just can't. This is miserable. What am I going to do? Well, acknowledge the fear. It's okay to say it. Find someone that you trust. Find a mentor or a cheerleader. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But Find someone that you can trust to share this with. As I lost my job, 
one of the things, the wonderful, amazing things that happened for me was I found an amazing Christian counselor in the Twin Cities who helped me to discover some things about my fear and how it had been holding me back for many, many years. And so what is holding you back? Acknowledge it, share it with someone. There's something about getting it out, either writing it down on paper, verbalizing it to someone that you trust that begins to make a difference. So what is your boulder? You cannot change what you don't acknowledge. Now, I'm not going to ask you to share what your boulders are, but I want to share with you about the boulder that has impacted me since I was 14, year, 14 years old. It was November 7th of 1969. It was 9.30 in the morning, and I was sitting in Mr. Wilson's math class in Buffalo, Minnesota, where we moved to from, my from Nebraska. My dad was a pastor. He pastored at a church in Nebraska, and then we moved to Minnesota. Both my parents were originally from Minnesota, so it was coming home for them. There was a knock on the door in Mr. Wilson's class, and he went and answered the door, and he turned around and looked at me and talked to the person that was, uh, that was at the door, and then he closed the door, and he said, David, pack up your things and head to the office. And I had no idea why I was being called down to the office. And all of my friends are like, oh, Dave, what did you do now? What did you do now? And I was a good kid. I didn't get in a lot of trouble in school. And so I walked down to the office. And as I walked in, the administrative assistant said, go down that hall and go in the second door on the right. So I went down that hall. I went in the second door on the right. And in that room was my older brother, Phil, now a junior, and the Catholic priest from town in Buffalo, Minnesota. And the Catholic priest said, Dave, your dad died this morning. When I went to school at 7.30, dad was alive. 9.30, dad's passed away. We walk across the street and we pick up, pick up my little brother, Tom, who is a third grader. And the elementary school and the, and the junior high, senior high were right across the street from each other. We picked up my little brother and we came out and the, the Catholic priest got us in a little semi-circle and he said, now boys, this is going to be tough on your mom. I don't want you to cry. I don't want you to ask questions. I just want you to be men. Well, I listened very carefully to that message and I didn't cry and I didn't ask any questions and I did what I thought it meant to be a man, even though at 14, all I was worried about was what sport was in season. And so we walked home, and we, again, lived literally right across the street from the school. The church that my dad pastored and the, and the schools were all right together, and the parsonage that we lived in was right there. And we walked in the house, and mom was there and greeted us in tears. And it was a difficult crisis time in our lives. Fast forward three weeks. The funeral has taken place. We're going to be able to stay in the parsonage for a while. We're not sure how long. And basketball practice starts. I'm six foot seven. At the time, I wasn't that, obviously. But basketball has always been a big part of my life. And so uh, basketball practice was over. I walked across the street. And I came into the house. And my mom called my, my two brothers to come to the table. And as we sat down, mom picked up the food off the kitchen counter, set it on the table slowly, and began to cry. And she said, I can't believe that I set five places instead of four. Three weeks after dad had passed away, she set a chair for him, waiting for him to come home. She went back into her room and was crying. And eventually my older brother got up and went back and consoled her. And then he came back out and my brothers and I sat and ate our supper quietly that night. When practice was over the next night, I stayed after and shot baskets took my time in the shower because I didn't want to go home to that again. When I got home about 6.15 or so, supper was neatly folded up in aluminum foil and sitting in the refrigerator, and I turned the oven on and put it in the oven and warmed up my supper and ate it in front of the TV. We lived in that parsonage for seven more months, and I never ate supper in that house again. My counselor helped me to recognize that that began a pattern of avoidance of not dealing with difficult things in my life. It happened in school, it happened in jobs, it happened in relationships. Over and over and over again, I began to cover, uncover all of these things where things were scary to deal with, 
And so much as the Catholic priest had said, uh, don't ask any questions, I didn't ask any questions about anything. I simply learned to avoid all of those things and pretend that life was good for me. One of the things that I've always wanted to do in my career is the very thing that I'm doing now. I run my own business as a speaker and as a personal development coach and as a trainer. And so I go around to companies and organizations and I speak. I deal one-on-one -on -one with people in a variety of different ways through, through uh, coaching. And then I also do some training in companies and organizations. But even in that, I had a great deal of fear. It wasn't until I lost my job that I began this job because I couldn't find work. And I had to find out if I'm not going to get a job, I need to find a way to make money. And so I was forced to find a way to do this, even though it's something that I've wanted to do since I was 28 years old, but I avoided it because it was scary. And so I didn't do it. So what is your self-talk? Now, as you are facing the transition challenge, or maybe you're facing some other challenge, what do you, what do you say to yourself in your mind as you face this challenge? As I face this challenge of wanting to work as a speaker, <clears throat> these are some of the things that I would say to myself. Who am I that anybody would want to hear what I have to say? I'm just a guy. Nothing special about me. There's nothing special about being able to stand up in front of a group of people and speak. Uh, for me, I enjoy it. I get great energy from it. Doesn't mean that I don't get nervous, but I enjoy it. And therefore, I assign my feelings about it. I place that on everybody else, that this isn't that big a deal. Anybody else could do this. I don't have any letters behind my name, so I don't have any credibility. I look at people that have letters behind their name, PhD, MD, uh, whatever it might happen to be, MA, whatever those letters are, and I'm sure some of you that are with us tonight have letters behind your name. Therefore, you are far smarter than I am. And what do I have to offer you? Uh, and I don't have any letters behind my name, so I don't have any credibility. Some of you are saying, yeah, but that first slide that you had up, you've got letters behind your name, Dave Cornell, BBG. That must mean something. Well, it does. It simply means big, bald guy. Uh, I don't know if you saw me on the screen before, but I don't have any hair and I'm six foot seven. It just stands for big, bald guy. But these are well-earned letters, I can tell you that. So I don't have any credibility. And then I don't have a dramatic story. The people who do this kind of work, uh, they have survived cancer. They have survived an airline hijacking. They have been orphaned at the age of three and raised in the wilderness by wolves. They have amazing, incredible stories. And I don't, I don't have an amazing, incredible story. So those are some of the things that I tell myself. What is it that you tell yourself as you are facing a challenging time in your life? And so that's step one. And so now we're going to take a look at some action steps for you around step one. Write your fear down. They say that if you write your goals down, you are, and again, depending on whatever, whatever report or study you read, you are far more likely to achieve those goals if you write them down. I believe the very same thing is true with our fears. I believe that if we write them down, if we get them out, we are far more likely to overcome them if we get them out. Secondly, write your self-talk down. Our self-talk is often a default for us. And we all work enough with computers that we know what the default is. It goes there automatically. And sometimes it's just easier to stay there. And that's what our self-talk does. If our self-talk says to us, Dave, you're too old to go do that. Don't, yeah, you're too old. Just forget about it. You'll never, you'll never be able to do it. And if I stay in that, I'm never going to accomplish anything. So write your self-talk down. Don't let that be the default. You need to begin to change that default position. Find a mentor and a cheerleader. You need to have these people in your life. The mentor is the person that has their hand in the small of your back, and you're leaning back going, no, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. And they're pushing you forward to places that are uncomfortable for you. And they are there to help 
even though it may not be the way that you want it. The cheerleader is the person that's the good friend that they're going to come and they're going to put their arm around you regardless. You may have done something really stupid, but they're going to say, wow, I can't believe that you did that, but good for you for doing something. At least you did something. Oftentimes when we live in our fear, we are static. We don't do anything. And I believe you're better off doing some, maybe some dumb things once in a while so that we know what not to do uh, in getting us to move in the direction of what we should be doing. Step number two is to begin to see your fear in a whole different way. John 9, 39 says, I have come to give sight to the blind and to show those who think they see that they are blind. And so we think of the Pharisees in this case. The Pharisees, they were the people of the law. They knew the Old Testament well, and they knew all the rules and the regulations, and, and yet Jesus came to show them that they were blind and to show those that maybe were struggling and didn't know very much about the, the Old Testament, but that they too could come to know who Jesus was and not be blind anymore. So how do we begin to see differently? Well, we're going to look at the frame, what I call the frame. And we start in the upper left-hand corner. And what it says, the way that we see things, our beliefs about situations, other people or ourselves affects how we feel. So now we're in the upper right-hand corner. How we feel affects what we do, lower right-hand corner, our behavior, our actions. And what we do affects what we get, the results. And then what we get tends to reinforce how we see or how we believe. So in essence, it's the self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? We see something in a certain way, so we feel a certain way about it. We take certain actions and we get a result and it's the same result over and over and over again. So we need to begin to see it differently. Well, let's take a look at an example from the ultimate framer of all time, Jesus Christ. We know the story of the adulterous woman where the Pharisees have caught her in the act of adultery. And they bring her to Jesus. And they say to her, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. She needs to be stoned to death. And they all have stones in their hand. So how did the Pharisees see that woman? They saw her as a sinner and somebody not worthy of living. How did they feel about her? They despised her and they wanted to kill her. What were they going to do? They were going to kill her. And what would they get? They would get a sense of self-righteousness because they had rid the world of a sinful woman. So how would they see the next adulterous woman in the very same way? Jesus, on the other hand, how did he see the woman? He saw her as a child of God. How did he feel about her? He loved her. What did he do? He saved her, both physically and spiritually. And what did he get? He got a redeemed person and a new life. And how would he see the next adulterous woman? How does he see us as people who are sinful people? Jesus was the ultimate framer. And so whatever situation you are seeing right now, and this is another reason to have a mentor, is often our situation, we are so close to it that we can't see it any differently. And so again, by having someone in our life that we can share the challenge with, we can help them or they can help us to begin to see things in a different way. So let's take a look at some examples that might fit your world. How do you see yourself? Maybe you're someone who uh, has had your, had your own business or, or want to be in your own business, or uh, even as an employee, you're a business person. So how do you see yourself? Are you a business person who happens to be a Christian? Or are you a Christian who happens to be a business person? What a dramatic difference in the seeing of that. So how do you see yourself? Are you a business person who happens to be a Christian or a Christian who happens to be a business person? How do you see networking? Oh, man, I can remember when I was out of work and they would have all of these special networking events, and I just hated going to them. I just thought, I don't want to go to those. They're never any good. I never meet anybody that can help me out. And then somebody shared with me a little secret about 
how to see networking differently. They said, Dave, don't go to the networking group for you. Go because you might see someone that you might be able to help. Wow, that changed my perspective. Earlier today, I was on the Crossroads website. And on the very front page of the Crossroads website is this, right in the middle of the screen. Seek to give, not to get. And oftentimes, when I was going to those networking meetings, it was all about me. What can I get from this? And this friend shared with me, Dave, change your C about that. What can you give when you go to a network meeting? So how do you see networking? Begin to see it maybe in a different way. And maybe some of you are already seeing that. Maybe you're all seeing it that way. And I'll just say, good for you. How do you see sharing your faith? Oh, man, I'm not an evangelist. I, I, I'm not very good at that. I'll leave that for the pastors and the evangelists. And But maybe the story that you have, and you all have a story, we all have a story. If we are believers, we all have a story of what God has done in our life through his son, Jesus Christ. And yet we often are afraid to share our faith because we're afraid what people might think, or we're afraid that they might reject us. And yet we often think that it's our responsibility to save the person. And the reality is it's not our job to save anybody. So we need to see that it's not our job. It's the job of the Holy Spirit. And we need to have the courage to share our faith, faith, knowing that it might bring someone to a saving grace with Jesus Christ. How do you see asking for help? You know, we live in the greatest country in the world, and we have all heard the phrase, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We don't ask for help. We, we do it on our own, and we fix our problems, and we, we don't ask for help. We see that as a sign of weakness, and yet asking for help can be one of the most courageous things that we can do is to ask someone for help. We feel weak when we do that. And yet we have to recognize that God puts people in our lives to help us. And God puts people in our lives so that they can share their gifts with us. And oftentimes when people are helping us, we have an opportunity to help them. But those kinds of things don't happen unless we're willing to ask for help. So where does our C come from? Well, our C comes from beliefs that we have about ourselves, and our beliefs come from messages that we have received over the course of our lives. And these messages have come to us from our parents, they've come to us from our siblings, they've come to us from friends, from teachers, from coaches, from band directors, they come from magazines that sit on the counter stand when we're checking out at the grocery store, they come from TV shows that we've watched, and these uh, messages develop beliefs, develop a C about ourselves. Let me tell you one message that I got while I was growing up. I can remember as a, as a young boy pitching the baseball to my dad in the backyard. And mom said it was time for me to come in and help with the dishes. So as I walked in to help my mom with the dishes, and I was probably seven or eight years old at the time, I said, Mom, I'm going to be a professional baseball player when I grow up. And my mom, being a loving mom and a, a very caring mom, said, Dave, those are things that happen to other people. They don't happen to people like us. And my mom didn't mean to, to shatter my dream in any way. She was trying to be protecting of me so that I wouldn't be disappointed later on in life. But the reality is that that message, which I remember to this day, and I can still see it happening in my mind, the reality is that that message was, Dave, you'll never be good enough as a baseball player. So just enjoy the game and don't worry. That developed a belief for me about baseball that developed a C for how I saw my, my skills as a baseball player. My guess is that even a, in a group of seven or eight that we have with us tonight, that somebody on this group maybe got, got some messages that were much harsher than that. Messages of things like, why did we even have you? You'll never amount to anything. You're not smart enough to go to college. Messages like that that have developed a C about who you are. Well, I can tell you from experience that with the help of my counselor, 
I work to change that belief and I work to change that message about the value that I bring. But it was the counselor that helped me to do that, to change the message that, Dave, that you have something special about you and you can share it and you need to share it. And if you don't share it, you're depriving the world and depri depriving God of who he created you to be. So what are the messages that you have received that are holding you back in this transition process? Whatever your fear is, you can take it and put it into this rectangle. And you might see it in a certain way, but how do you begin to see it differently? Let me tell you how I began to see my fear differently about starting my own business as a speaker and a coach and a trainer. First of all, 1 Peter 4.10 says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Each one of you, each one of us on the call tonight have been given special gifts by God. And these gifts aren't for us, but they are for the people that we encounter in our everyday lives. They're for the people that God puts in front of us. And oftentimes we don't see those gifts as a big deal because they come easy to us. They're natural for us often. I'm not saying that's always the case. And so we pass them off as not being any big deal. And yet, those are gifts that God has given us. What are the gifts that God has given you that you may be holding back from others? My counselor, again, helped me to begin to recognize that my ability to speak and communicate and tell stories in a way that can make a difference in people's lives, that is one of my gifts. Until I started working with her, I never saw it as a gift. I always passed it off as no big deal. Anybody can do this. She said, Dave, no, not anybody can do this. And let me tell you, if you don't do this, that is selfish on your part because, again, you are denying God who he created you to be, and you're denying the opportunity for people to hear your story so that it can make a difference in their lives. Wow. How many of us want to be thought of as being selfish? I'd never thought about this as being selfish, but it really opened my eyes and recognize that we are being selfish when we are not stepping into the fears that we have courageously rather than running from the fears that we have and not dealing with them. Let me share you a, a little more dramatic example of that. This quote is from the Free Report, which was done back in 2011. You may remember uh, Penn State football coach Jerry Sandusky. He was an assistant football coach for Joe Paterno. Back in the year 2000, there were two custodians at the Penn State football facility. Each of them, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, witnessed Jerry Sandusky molesting a young boy in the shower. They got together and each shared their story. They decided to go to their supervisor and tell the supervisor what they saw. The group of them, the group of the three of them, decided not to say anything. They were afraid that they would lose their jobs. So they chose not to say anything. They said going against Joe Paterno and Penn State football would be like going against the president of the United States. That's all in the free report. You can read it right in the report. And so they chose to live in fear and not say anything. Jerry Sandusky was allowed for 11 more years to molest young boys because they chose fear over courage. Could they have lost their jobs? Sure, they could have lost their jobs. As I said at the beginning, there's a price to courage, but there's, I believe, an even bigger price to fear. So as you think about the fear that you might be facing, you have to ask yourself this question. Who pays the price? For your fear. And every time that I'm asked to speak, I think in my mind, because the, the old self-talk is always there, why would these people want to hear what I have to say? But then I have to ask myself this question, who would pay the price if I don't do this? And I believe, even with a group of seven or eight here tonight, that somebody really needs to hear this. And if I didn't do it, you wouldn't hear it. And might your struggle might continue to go on. And again, this isn't about me, but this is about God working through me to share the gifts that he has given me. 
So who pays the price for your fear? Because you're unwilling and afraid to step into things courageously. So our courage action steps are on number two. Write down your messages. Again, those messages are defaults for us. And we need to become so familiar with them that when they pop up in our mind, we can begin to change the message right away. Again, those are defaults. And again, I would encourage you, if you need to, find a counselor to help you to dig this stuff up. If you don't want to find a counselor, find a friend that you trust that you can share these things with and get them out. Write down your old C and your new C. Our old C is pretty easy to figure. This is how I see it. But our new C, again, sometimes is difficult to come to because we're so close to it that we can't see any way out of it. So find a friend or a mentor that you can trust. And then write down who is paying a price for your fear and what that looks like. Now, you may not be able to put a face to it, but in some cases you can. But you might be able to see my coworker is paying a price because I'm not standing up for them. Or uh, my kids are paying a price because I'm not standing up for them. Uh, I, I, whatever the case might be, if there is something that you are not dealing with because you're afraid, somebody is paying a price. We often think our fears only impact us when the reality is our fears impact other people as well. So we've named our fear, we've framed our fear, and now we're going to begin to claim our courage. We're going to begin to turn our boulders into pebbles. <clears throat> John 10.10, 10, one of my favorite scripture passages. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And the thief, of course, is Satan. And Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy our dreams. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy our hopes. And more often than not, he comes subtly. He doesn't come with guns blazing and, and flags waving. He does it sometimes that way, but more often than not, he comes and he whispers in our ear and he says, you're not smart enough to do that. You're too old to do that. Oh, who are you going to let? Oh, no, don't do that because you're going to let your mom or dad down. So st he steals, kills, and destroys in very subtle ways. This verse is, and I see right after the word destroy and right before the word I is a fence. So the left side of the fence is the, is the world of the thief, and the right side of the fence is the world of Jesus Christ. And which do we choose? Are we going to let the thief steal, kill, and destroy our dreams and hopes? Or are we going to trust that Jesus is going to be with us wherever we go, just as he talked about us with Joshua 1.9, He's got his arm around us, and we're going to step into the fire, not knowing what we're going to encounter, knowing that God is with us. So which side of that fence do you want to be on? One of the things that I learned in this process was the lesson of the crack. Here's a picture that I took when we lived down in Savage, uh, down in the Twin Cities. And as you can see in the lower right-hand corner of that, there is a stalk of corn growing out of cement. And I remember seeing that 20 years ago, I took this picture. I didn't know I would ever use it for anything, but I thought, that's amazing. I got to take a picture of that. So how in the world does a, a, a seed of corn find a way to grow right in the midst of a four-lane road and cement median, and yet there's corn growing? Somehow, that seed of corn found a crack and it found a way to weasel its way on down into the ground and grow in a place where we would never think that it could grow. For me, the lesson of this crack in my journey of wanting to become a speaker and a coach and a trainer was the word maybe. I used to say to myself, I want to make my living as a speaker and a coach and a trainer, but I'm not good enough to make my living as a speaker and a coach and a trainer. Wow. If that's my mindset, how likely am I going to be able to do to make that? Probably not very much. And again, I had some wonderful friends, some wonderful mentors that I met with regularly. And one of them say, said, Dave, have you ever heard of the power of the word maybe? 
Just put the word maybe in front of that statement. I'll never make my living as a speaker and a coach and a trainer. Maybe I'll never make my living as a speaker and a coach and a trainer. But you see, now there's a crack. And in that crack is a little bit of hope. Maybe I won't, but maybe I will. What is it that you say to yourself about your fear? about maybe a certain job that you want to get or a certain company that you want to work for. And you say, I would really love to work there, but that's never going to work out. Maybe it will never work out. Maybe you want to start your own business. And so you always say to yourself, oh, I really want to start my own business, but I have no idea. I could never make that work because I don't know what to do. Maybe you could never make that work, but maybe you could. Do you have the courage to think about the maybes in your life and begin to courageously step into that. And so we begin to chip away at the boulders that we have in front of us that are keeping us from the red trucks beyond the boulder. And so how do we begin to chip away at the boulder? Recognize that the fear will always be there. This is not about becoming fearless. If you Google fearless living or living fearlessly, you will find, I think with both of them, there are over 50 million things that you can look up on either one of those. But I say, if you are waiting to be fearless in your journey, you're never going to get anywhere because we can always find some reason that the ducks are all not lined up yet. There's got to be one more duck that I can grab. No, this is about living courageously. And living courageously means that We take that first step not knowing what step two or step three or step four is, but we take that first step knowing that God is with us just as he told us he is, and knowing that step number one might fail, but that's okay because we've learned a way not to do it. So recognize that the fear will always be there and courageously step into it. Do something scary every week. What are you doing to challenge yourself to be uncomfortable? So now as we get into nicer and warmer weather, uh, maybe you've never been a, a runner before, and maybe it might be a challenge for you to run a 5K. So you say, okay, I don't want to do that. I have no idea how to do that, but it would scare me to do that, but I'm going to go run a 5K. Uh, maybe it's to apply for a certain job. That's scary. I don't I, I, I've only got three of the things that on that list of 10 that they're looking for. I only meet three of them, but you know what? I'm going to apply for that job anyway. What do you do to challenge yourself to be courageous? And, and then don't discount your own abilities. We are all far more gifted and talented than we give ourselves credit for. This is a picture from my sophomore year in high school in Buffalo. And I was brought up to the varsity as a sophomore. My coach, and you see the arrow pointing at his head as one of my friends wrote in the yearbook, but my coach on the very first day of practice saw me as a six foot three inch sophomore, thought this kid might grow a little bit more. So he called me into his office at the end of the first day of practice. And he said, Dave, I'm going to have you play the junior varsity games, but then I'm going to bring you up and I'm going to have you dress for the varsity games. And when we're way ahead or way behind, I'm going to put you in the game so you can start to get some experience. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. That would be that would be fun. I was the only sophomore on the varsity basketball team, and there hadn't been any sophomores on there for a long time. And so, as you can see, you see that guy on the far right-hand side of the picture. His name is Steve. I sat next to Steve. I even got cropped out of the picture and didn't get into the yearbook. But I sat next to Steve, and Steve said, Dave, here's what we're going to do. He said, and I've already talked to the manager, and he said, We're going to give money to the manager before every game where there's no chance that we are playing because it's going to be a close game. We're going to give money to the manager and he's going to put popcorn and pop under our seats and we can enjoy the game like fans because really that's all we're going to be. And the coach is going to be so focused on the game, he's not going to be looking down at us. And so the first game comes and it's against a rival team. No way that Steve and I are playing in this game. And the Uh, We get all done with the warmups and Steve and I go to take our seats at the end of the bench. And sure enough, there's popcorn and pop underneath our seats. Wow, this is so cool. And our manager was so good. He refreshed us at halftime. I don't know how he did it, but we had new pop and new popcorn 
underneath our seats at halftime. And that's how the season went. If it was a game where we might play, no popcorn and pop. If it was a game where we weren't going to play, popcorn and pop. It's late in the season. There's uh, We're playing Chaska High School. We are tied with them for the conference lead. And there's no way that Steve and I are playing in this game. Popcorn and pop is there at the beginning of the game. Popcorn and pop is there at halftime. The game is everything everybody imagined it would be. Tied back and forth. We're ahead. They're ahead. It's fans on both sides of the of the teams are going crazy. And five minutes to go in the game, the score is tied, and Steve elbows me in the ribs. And he points down at the head coach. And I look down, and here he's hollering my name, saying, Cornell, Cornell. And he's waving me down to him. And I have literally just filled my mouth with popcorn. And I'm thinking, what in the world does he want? Do we need towels? Do we need water? What do we? And I get to him, and he says, get in the game for Davis. And I'm stunned. I don't go into these kinds of games. What is he doing? What is he thinking? And he puts me in the game. And in those last five minutes, I had five points, four rebounds, and I blocked a shot. Now, I wish I could tell you we won the game. We didn't win the game. But my coach saw things in me that I didn't see in myself. He had been watching me since practice started in November and December and January and now February. He saw things that I didn't see in myself. What do people see in you that you don't see in yourself? But maybe they tell you and you just pass it off. What has God created you for that he sees in you that you don't see in yourself that you need to begin to courageously step into? When my coach called me down there, he didn't say, Dave, look at the score. It's tied. I think this is a good time for you to go in. What do you think? He said, no. He said, get in the game. So maybe that's for some of you tonight. That's all you need to hear. You've been in this transition process and been sitting in the stands and taking it easy and kind of soaking it all in, wait for the right time. And maybe all you need to hear is it's time for you to get in the game. Fear calls us to be spectators. Courage calls us to get in the game. And courage requires action. So now we begin to turn our boulders into pebbles. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us, able to accomplish infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. What can God through, do through you if you courageously step into what he's calling you to do? So here's your action steps around number three. Create your list to eliminate negative thoughts. Have a plan when those negative thoughts show up in your mind. Find the crack in your boulder. Use the word maybe. It's a powerful word. And begin to do scary, scary things to begin to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And I'll close tonight with this last story, and it's from the movie Night and Day, K-N-I-G-H-T. I think it's from 2010. Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz are in that movie, and they meet at the beginning of the movie on an airplane. And they begin sitting across the aisle from each other, and they have a general conversation. Where are you from? Where are you going? What do you do? And then the conversation changes to what they hope to do someday. Cameron Diaz says, someday I hope to write a book. Tom Cruise says, someday I hope to go scuba diving in the Great Barrier Reef. Cameron Diaz says, someday I hope to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And then Tom Cruise brings the whole conversation to an abrupt halt when he says, someday is code for never. Wow. Wow. What are the some days that you have that because you've not put any time frame on it, you can always say someday I want to do this or someday I want to do that. You know what your some days are. Well, I want to challenge and, and encourage you as we close tonight. I want to challenge and encourage you to name your fear, to frame your fear, and to make today your someday to claim your courage. You know what that looks like. You maybe even know what the first step is, and I want to challenge you and encourage you to begin that journey today. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be with you. This is where you can connect with me if you have any interest. I've got a book on Amazon that you can see on the left, and I also have an online course where you can walk through this with exercises. There's both a, a secular version and a faith-based version. Uh, and if you use the coupon code CROSSROADS, it'll save you 50 bucks. 
It's uh, normally 149. You can get it for 99. And so that's there if you just use that uh, coupon code of Crossroads. And thank you for the opportunity to be with you. And I wish you all well on your journey to a more courageous life. Well, thank you, Dave. That was wonderful. Um, and you never disappoint. And I've seen you many times and I always enjoy it. So thank you. I think we all can take a lot out of that uh, message tonight and take action soon um, and uh, maybe start our journey very quickly. So um, thanks again for uh, uh, being with us tonight. I wanted to point out we do appreciate uh, the opportunity to have uh, speakers like Dave. Uh, we also appreciate um, having live speakers uh, for our um, our uh, messages of motivation. So, um, you know, that we had tonight uh, with I am second. Um, that was, those are good uh, when they're when they're truly um, delivered by someone we know um, that is dealing with something in our own uh, community. So, um, you know, we're always looking for those people to uh, to deliver those things. So if you're uh, if you know somebody or you uh, you want to do it yourself, um, um, certainly get a hold of uh, Harry or myself, uh, and we'd uh, we can talk to you about that. So um, <clears throat> now I want to uh, share my slides with you, uh, which are the uh, um, the crossroads uh, slides. So bear with me as I share those. Uh, I always seem to go to the end when I share them. Okay, let's see. And this is the slideshow. Okay, so welcome to Crossroads. Um, our Crossroads, uh, I, for if it's your first time with us, um, you will, and you registered, you will receive this gift. Um, of devotions, a book of devotions by Dale Crankenkamp. Uh, how long, oh Lord, how long? Um, it's a great book, lots of great stuff in it. Um, and uh, one of the things in transition, we, uh, we, uh, we have a lot of ups and downs. Uh, these devotions will help you with those ups and downs. It's really something that I, uh, I highly recommend uh, for all. So um, it's uh, read it and enjoy. The uh, MN Crossroads website. Um, if you signed up for today's uh, website you, or web webinar, you probably were on the website. If you haven't explored it, there are many great things on there um, from job boards uh, to exercises and uh, uh, analysis that you can do about your skill sets. Um, there are um, ways that you can sign up for different things. Um, check it out. Uh, go through it. Um, one of the things about our job board that I think is really neat and uh, exciting is each of the jobs comes with a contact. So if you have questions about the job or you want to learn more, you can always reach out to this person who's uh, listed there and, uh, and, and get that information that you need uh, to fulfill yourself, your questions in, uh, in about the job. So uh, check that out. Uh, it's something they there. And there's many resources on there. So give it a look, see, and I think you'll find that there's, a, there's something in there for everyone. I alluded to it earlier when I did the introduction that we have three sites uh, for Crossroads uh, when we start meeting again in person. And we are looking to do that in the near future. One of the key things about meeting in person is the networking aspect. And I, I know Dave alluded to it uh, as uh, is something that uh, many people dread. Uh, but if you use Dave's words of wisdom, if you go there looking to give, uh, you might receive something that's very valuable. So um, networking is really uh, uh, underrated um, as it relates to the Crossroads experience. And uh, we don't get that uh, in our, our seminars like this on Zoom. So um, hopefully soon we'll be back in person. And if we are, these are the three sites. We have a Grace Church site, the Woodbury Lutheran site, and the North Heights uh, Lutheran Church in Arden Hills, um, which um, is fairly new and, uh, and is an opportunity for those people on the north side of the Twin Cities. Weekly opportunities with Crossroads. One of the um, things that we offer uh, and uh, everything that 
almost everything that we offer through Crossroads is free. Um, the networking with grace, and you can sign up uh, to attend the online uh, networking session on the website. Uh, it meets every Thursday morning, um, and it's run by um, the two Wes's, uh, uh, Wes Roper and Wes Tang, and they uh, they deliver a session where you can get lots of live information, and they'll help you through the process of networking uh, online, and uh, you, you could possibly find a job lead that way, and maybe uh, start your next career venture very quickly. So check out Networking with Grace uh, every Thursday morning. Sign up and go and, and see what you can find through networking. One-on-one -on -one coaching. Many times we have an opportunity to, to have an interview and we're just, we're, we can't figure out what's not working in our interviews or what, what we need to do to really deliver a high impact um, interview or we're working on our star stories and we don't know how to convert them into real impactful stories that can impact how the uh, interviewee sees us in the job and how we'll perform. Um, so uh, sign up for online coaching. You can get that right through our website. You can just type in little uh, requests that you want and uh, some will get back to you. Um, and uh, people do get back to you. I trust me on that. And they will help you in a lot of ways. So whatever you need from a coaching, let's say interviewing, you want to look at a resume, uh, you need to, you need help on creating star stories. And that's situational test, uh, action result messages about experiences in your past that you can deliver that show how you perform in the future. Um, so, uh, you know, sign up, find some help when you need it related to your job search. One-on-one -on -one coaching, it's there. It's on the website, give it a look. Many times we get burdened in job search and transition and we need a little extra help. And sometimes we need a little extra help through prayer. And you can get prayer help through our website. Uh, we have a whole team of people uh, that love praying for other people and helping them through the, the, uh, the art of praying and asking God for that help. Um, so if you need that help, it's available for you. And all you have to do is go to the website and sign up and someone will be there working uh, to, with the message of prayer uh, to help you fulfill your needs uh, and get that actual uh, extra boost you might need to be successful. Um, our whole soul, soul care team is available for that opportunity. And then online classes. When we talk about online classes, we, we're talking about the small group classes. Uh, they're the eight week course. Uh, they, they're high impact, high touch. Uh, they go through many different things. Um, you, can, you can read that there's eight different um, sections, uh, one on attitude. Uh, attitude is often the thing that has to be overcome and, and really put you on your way be a pod and have so you can have a positive experience and that's 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 step one in small group classes networking we talk about networking how to be successful at networking uh the networking the uh, small group classes can help you in a way uh, about how to target your networking visit how to set it up how to really look at it how to how to make the right choices in networking and it can really help you in a lot of ways around putting the structure together of a networking meeting when you do get a, a, a great opportunity to meet with someone who it could be a bridge to a job somewhere, or it could be the person that's looking to hire and just is looking for um, in the future and is just looking for candidates and that future may come more quickly than, than they know. Um, resumes. We talk about resumes a lot uh, in, in our seminars, and they're one of the biggest questions many people have. How do I build a, a successful resume? What do I put on it? How do I put the, the dates and the experience? Uh, how do I make, make it pop? And how do I deliver the type of real substance that people are looking for? Well, we do that in the, uh, in the whole session associated with resume building. And the small groups classes can help you in a great way with those types of things. And interviewing, we talk about interviewing a lot. Uh, and in our, our seminars, we'll 
in the small group classes, we help people with interviewing and how to do it successfully, how to really prepare for it, how to how to deliver the uh, start stories in a way that will be impactful, uh, how to make a great first impression, how to do a, a great um, elevator pitch, how to do a tell me about yourself pitch. All those things are part of the interviewing process. And we really talk about and really deliver it in our small group classes. But one thing about a small group class, especially when they're meeting uh, in person, but also online is you get the weekly accountability kind of uh, nudges that you need in order to be safe. You work with other people, you get acquainted with different people um, that you work with and you might, uh, you might partner up and, and, and help each other in a way uh, that be and become fast friends for life even. So um, small group classes have a lot of intrinsic values that we don't think about, but when you're in them and you come out of them, you have those, those values uh, that you can take with you. Um, so small, I highly recommend you sign up for a small group class. We have one starting uh, on the 17th, which is Monday. I know that's short notice, um, but uh, you know, the, check it out on the website, get signed up, go to the, uh, you know, hopefully it, it, you know, there's a lot of other interesting people in there that are looking to, um, to get, you know, to get an extra edge in, in their job search. So um, I would, I would tell you, don't hesitate because Monday's just a weekend away. So um, small classes are available uh, each and every month. Um, they're online right now uh, and uh, you get a valuable book uh, that's um, associated with this well, with a lot of resources in it that I highly, highly uh, would recommend that you go through and really work through to get the value out of the small group class. So that's something uh, that we deliver at Crossroads. We also have our LinkedIn group, uh, which has over 2,000, 2,500 members. Um, who have all gone through job search? We uh, that are valuable networking connections for you that uh, have messages uh, that they share on there. Uh, there's also our, our messages from Crossroads. There's other announcements, so it can be very uh, productive for you to be a member of the MN Crossroads Career Network. Just type it into the search, ask to join, and uh, and go to town and find the information you need on that LinkedIn group. All of our seminars, or most of our seminars, go on to our YouTube channel, and uh, you can view them, um, you know, review them, and go through them because you, you know, you maybe missed something the first time, or you want to just see it again because it, it's high impact, and you want to be impacted again. Um, so check it out our YouTube channel, um, and uh, you can find uh, you know the information about it right there on our webinar on our uh, uh, through. Uh, uh, typing in MN Crossroads in the search of your YouTube, and you'll find um, different people who have done um, and the highly impactful seminars that are out there that you, you can see and, and watch time and time again. Additional resources. Uh, we are very thankful to be partnered with, in a lot of ways, with Thrivent, and Thrivent uh, has delivered a lot of the financial resources we need in order to give uh, the products that we put out there on a free basis on a, on a uh, monthly and a annual basis. So they're a great partner. And they're also offering uh, three monthly seminars on financial considerations during jo job transition. They're available. Um, you can sign up for them or uh, find out the schedules and the details on our website. So uh, do that. And uh, if you're looking for some financial help and Thriving is a great partner and they do a great job in those seminars. These are the volunteers of Crossroads Career Network. Um, this is just a small uh, cross section of them. There, there are many more, I would imagine, uh, that uh, we couldn't fit on the slide. Uh, but uh, this is what it takes for Crossroads to be successful. The volunteers that devote their time and energy to it. Um, and uh, if you, you know somebody that uh, you recognize somebody here, thank them for being a, a volunteer at, the, at Crossroads because they really make a difference in people's lives. If you're looking for 
a church home and you haven't and uh, you don't know where to start, uh, you can start with one of our three churches, uh, Woodbury Lutheran um, or North Heights Church or Grace Church. Uh, check out the websites, check out when they meet, uh, check out how they do, um, you know, the things that they have on the website that tell you about what they do and how they do it. Um, it might be uh, your invitation to find in the church home you've always desired. Um, so give it a shot. Uh, they're available there. So that is uh, what we, um, we have available through Crossroads that we're sharing with you tonight. I hope uh, you find that to be um, uh, helpful. Um, so I want to thank um, all the resources have been. If you didn't know, uh, Harry uh, has been in the background, uh, Harry Urschel. Uh, he's the one that makes sure everything goes well uh, during the, uh, the presentation. Thank you, Harry. Um, I want to um, tell you're going to receive an email tomorrow uh, with uh, anything else, uh, certain, certain things that you um, would expect if this is your first time um, with Crossroads. Um, so um, check that out. Make sure you follow up on that. If you thought the eight week course was uh, was something you were you were looking to do, I wouldn't hesitate. I'd get signed up tomorrow or tonight yet uh, before you go. So uh, give that a shot. You'll uh, you won't regret it, I would think. Um, so um, give that a shot and sign up. Uh, networking on Thursday mornings. Give that a shot too because. The Wes's will be very helpful for you. I, they do a great job at putting the, that on every um, Thursday morning. And uh, you might find the next opportunity. You, uh, they say 80% of all jobs are obtained through networking. So I would recommend you start networking and uh, uh, this coming Thursday with the Wes's. And then one-on-one -on -one help, the prayer support that I talked about. They're all available. Our next seminar will be next uh, Thursday morning at 7.30. It'll be Michael Hurley delivering um, how to navigate application tracking systems. Uh, it starts at 7.30. Um, sign up. Again, it's April 20th, 7.30 um, next Thursday. I hope all of this was worthwhile for you today. I hope you enjoyed Dave's um, uh, Cultivating Courage uh, and his uh, webinar. Uh, tonight, because I certainly did. It was wonderful. And there was a lot of great things to uh, take and put into action there. Best wish wishes on your job search. And we hope you'll be back soon. Uh, we really don't hope you'll be back soon. We hope you get a job and that you'll, you, you might uh, recommend that someone else who's in transition comes and joins us. So have a wonderful rest of the week and have a great weekend. Uh, and uh, good night. <laughs>